It is our deepest need as human beings to learn to live intimately with God. It is what we were made for. Back in the beginning of our story, before the fall of man, before we sent the world spinning off its axis, there was a paradise called Eden. In that garden of life as it was meant to be, there lived the first man and woman. Their story is important to us because whatever it was they were and whatever it was they had, we were also meant to be and to have. And what they enjoyed above all of the other delights of that place was this. They walked with God. They talked with Him and He with them. For this you and I were made and this we must recover. Welcome to the Ransom Tar Podcast. I'm Alan Arnold, and you're listening to John Eldridge read from his book, Walking with God. As a staff, we're often asked what our favorite book is that John or Stacy has written. And for me, it's an easy answer. Walking with God transformed my life. It took me from an understanding of just simply praying to God to conversation with God. And that began a process that changed everything. Because really, in life, we have two options. We can either try to do life on our own as an orphan, trying to figure everything out, trying to weigh the best options, creating a pro and con list, or we can walk with God as sons and daughters. So we're going to start this week with the introduction and the prelude to his book, Walking with God, will continue over the next three weeks with additional content and chapters from his book. But today, we begin with just the fundamental questions of what does it look like to walk through life with God, to hear his voice, and to find joy in the journey of doing life together intimately and actively with God. Here's John reading from his book. Walking with God. I spent too many years trying to figure out life on my own, reading books, attending classes, always keeping an eye out for the folks who seemed to be getting the hang of things. I'd notice that the neighbor's kids seemed to be doing well, and I'd think to myself, what do they do that I'm not doing? Their kids are in sports. Maybe I should get mine in sports. I'd walk away from a conversation with someone who seemed to be on top of the world and afterward, I'd think, she seems so well-read. I'm not reading enough. I should read more. I'd hear that a colleague was doing well financially, and quickly I'd jump to, he spends time managing his money. I ought to do that. We do this all the time, all of us, this monitoring and assessing and observing and adjusting, trying to find the keys to make life work. We end up with quite a list. But the only lasting fruit it seems to bear is that it ties us up in knots. Am I supposed to be reading now, or exercising, or monitoring my fat intake, or creating a teachable moment with my son? The good news is, you can't figure out life like that. You can't possibly master enough principles and disciplines to ensure that your life works out. You weren't meant to, and God won't let you. For he knows that if we succeed without him, we will be infinitely farther from him. We will come to believe terrible things about the universe. Things like, I can make it on my own. And, if only I try harder, I can succeed. That whole approach to life, trying to figure it out, beat the odds, get on top of your game, it is utterly godless. Meaning, entirely without God. He is nowhere in those considerations. That sort of scrambling smacks more of the infamous folks who raised the Tower of Babel than it does of those who walked with God in the garden in the cool of the day. In the end, I'd much rather have God. You might have heard the old saying, give someone a fish and you feed him for a day teach someone to fish and you feed him for the rest of his life? The same holds true for life itself. 
If you give someone an answer, a rule, a principle, you help them solve one problem. But if you teach him to walk with God, well, then you've helped him solve the rest of his life. You've helped tap him into an inexhaustible source of guidance and comfort and protection. Really now, if you knew you had the opportunity to develop a conversational intimacy with the wisest, kindest, most generous, and seasoned person in the world, wouldn't it make sense to spend time with them as opposed to, say, slogging your way through on your own? Whatever our situation in life, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, our deepest and most pressing need is to learn to walk with God, to hear His voice, to follow Him intimately. It is the most essential turn of events that could ever take place in the life of any human being, for it brings us back to the source of life. Everything else we long for can then flow forth from this union. But how do we get there? How do we learn to live with God, to walk with Him each day in conversational intimacy? Over the years, I've read with longing the stories of early disciples like Athanasius, who had the help of a spiritual giant like Anthony, or the Benedictines with Benedict, or the followers of Columba living with him on Iona. And I found myself wondering, where do people get that today? The stories feel like Aesop's fables, charming but archaic. I don't know anyone who lives in the same hut with a genuine spiritual counselor, mentor, father, or director with whom they can process the unfolding events of their life anytime they'd like. I know such fathers exist, and I pray they increase, but in the meantime, they are rare. Most of us haven't the option, but we can still learn. You might not have access to a master fly fisherman, but if you could watch someone cast who has been at it for a few years, you would learn a lot. When Stacy and I first married, we loved to hang out with couples who'd been hitched for a decade or two. There was so much to gain simply from hearing their experiences, the good and the bad. And in truth, it was often the tales of their mistakes that helped us most. And so I found that by describing my experiences and putting words to the things that God is showing me, I can shed light on your experiences and put words to things God is showing you. In sharing these stories, I am in no way suggesting that this is the only way to walk with God. But as George MacDonald said, As no scripture is of private interpretation, so there is no feeling in any human heart which exists in that heart alone, which is not in some form or degree in every human heart. And so what I offer here is a series of stories of what it looks like to walk with God over the course of about a year. I'm going to open my journals to you, or at least part of them, the more helpful part, I hope. When Ernest Hemingway wrote Green Hills of Africa in 1935, he felt he was taking a worthy risk. He said this, I have attempted to write an absolutely true book to see whether the shape of a country and the pattern of a month's action can, if truly presented, compete with a work of the imagination. Now, how much more valuable might this be if we could share with one another the stories of our true encounters with God? Not the mountaintop ones, but the everyday encounters as they are lived out over a year. Some of these stories will open up new horizons for you. That is certainly my hope. Learning to hear the voice of God may itself be a new frontier and an exciting one, with unexpected joys around each new turn. You will, no doubt, come across lessons you've already learned, probably better than I. But you may have forgotten. We do forget even the most precious encounters we have with God. Perhaps I will help you to remember and recover what you might have lost. I may also help you tell your own story as well, give you eyes to see what is unfolding and help you set it down so that it doesn't slip away. 
It will help you, audio listeners, to understand that the book is broken into four sections, summer, fall, winter, and spring, with a prelude, and that within each of those sections, there are simply story headings. I'll give you the heading of a story, and then I'll tell you the story. I take some comfort in this quote from Frederick Buechner, from his book, Now and Then. There is something more than a little disconcerting about writing autobiography. When people have occasionally asked me what I was working on, I have found it impossible to tell them without an inward blush, as if anybody cares or should care. But I do it anyway. I do it because it seems to me that no matter who you are and no matter how eloquent or otherwise, if you tell your own story with sufficient candor and concreteness It will be an interesting story, and in some sense, a universal story. Buechner goes on to say, If God speaks to us at all, other than through such official channels as the Bible and the Church, then I think that he speaks to us largely through what happens to us. So what I have done in this book is to listen back over what has happened to me, as I hope my readers may be moved to listen back over what has happened to them. For the sound, above all, of his voice, for his word to us is both recoverable and precious beyond telling. Listening to God. If only I had listened. We have a family tradition of going out into the woods each year after Thanksgiving to cut down our Christmas tree. It's something we started when the boys were small, and over the years it became the event to help us inaugurate the Christmas season. We bundle the boys up and head off to the snowy woods on a Saturday morning. Stacy brings hot cocoa in a thermos. I bring the rope and the saw. Inevitably, I think there's a better tree just over the next hill, which is always one more hill away. And family members start peeling off and heading back to the car while I cut down a tree that's always three feet too tall and drag it a mile. It's all part of the tradition. Now, You get a pretty funky-looking tree, sort of a Charlie Brown tree, when you go out to cut one down on your own. But it's our tree, with a story that goes along with it. We love it. Most of the time. Last year, we headed out for the tree the weekend after Thanksgiving weekend. There was new excitement to the adventure. We'd bought some land way out in the mountains, and this would be the first time we'd ever been able to cut down a tree on our own property. I envisioned a family hike on snowshoes up through the forest, hot drinks by the fire afterwards, board games, rich memories. That's not exactly how it turned out. A blizzard came upon us during the night and dumped about two feet of snow on the back roads. We decided we'd better get out while we can, but in the first five minutes of our journey home, we slide off into a ditch. It takes us more than an hour to dig out. We have no shovel. We use the boys' plastic sled with repeated failures. Finally, the only way we can get the Suburban to climb up onto the road is to have the whole family on the right side of the truck, outside, on the running boards, riding it like a catamaran while I gun it for all it's worth. Slowly, we make it back to the highway. I get out to check the tree. We did get the tree, three feet too tall, and discover now that we have two flat tires. Not one, two. It is ten degrees outside, and the wind is howling down from the north, bringing the wind chill to minus ten, as in ten below zero. I know I have one spare tire, but not two. Who carries two? Who gets two flat tires at the same time? I did have a can of fix-a-flat. Maybe that would get us into town. Nope, it's frozen. When I get out to deal with the situation, I leave the flashers on to warn oncoming traffic of our condition. Now the battery is dead. The word that comes to mind is ordeal. It was an ordeal. And now here is my confession. We weren't supposed to go. We would prayed about the weekend, asking God when it would be a good time to head out. This was the day after Thanksgiving, Friday, and both Stacy and I sensed God saying we were to go up the following day. But it didn't make sense to us. We were tired, and the boys wanted to see their friends. There were all sorts of reasons not to go, but more so there was that lingering unbelief that often passes for weariness, 
that thing in us that sort of whines, really? Do we really have to do this now, God? So we ignored the council and went the following weekend. Now, the weekend God told us to go was a gorgeous weekend. No snow, sunny skies, no wind. The whole event would have been delightful. But no, we had to do things our way. How does the old hymn go? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The whole ordeal could have been avoided had we simply listened. The Power of Assumptions I ran into an old acquaintance at the bookstore today. Actually, I was nearly out the door when he called my name, so I turned back in to say hello and chat for a few minutes. He seemed not well, half the man he used to be. I wondered why. I expected him to say that he had suffered some major loss, a loved one, I feared, or maybe it was a prolonged illness. Not that he was visibly deteriorating, as some people do in the late stages of cancer, but there was something about his countenance a loss of some essential part of himself. You know the look. Many people have it, actually. It's a confused and disheartened look. As we talked, it became clear that he had simply been eroded by a number of confusing years, strung together by disappointment. As I left the store, I found myself thinking, he held such promise. What happened? It has to do with assumptions. He assumed that God, being a loving God, was going to come through for him. In the sense of bless his choices, his ministry, make his life good. He looked sort of dazed and hurt that it hadn't happened. He was trying to put a good face on it, but you could see that he had lost heart. This may be one of the most common most unquestioned and most naive assumptions people who believe in God share. We assume that because we believe in God and because He is love, He's going to give us a happy life. A plus B equals C. You may not be so bold as to state this assumption out loud. You may not even think that you hold this assumption. But notice your shock when things don't go well. Notice your feelings of abandonment and betrayal when life doesn't work out. Notice that often you feel as though God isn't really all that close or involved, feel that he isn't paying attention to your life. Now, it's not fair to diagnose someone else's life without having some intimate knowledge of their situation and the story leading up to it and what God is after. But I do have enough information to say that this man assumed that the Christian life was basically about believing in God and doing good. Be a good person. And that's good. That's a beginning. But it's just a beginning. It's sort of like saying that the way to have a good friendship is not to betray the other person. And that will certainly help. You certainly want to have that going. But there's a whole lot more to friendship than simply not committing a betrayal, wouldn't you say? I know this fellow also holds the assumption that God doesn't really speak to his children. And so, when he found himself assaulted and undermined by all that had unfolded in his life, he had no source of guidance or explanation. It was sad to see the toll it had taken. I left the store thinking about assumptions, how they are either helping us or hurting us every single day of our lives. Our assumptions control our interpretation of events, and they supply a great deal of the momentum and direction for our lives. It's important that we take a look at them, and life will provide hundreds of opportunities to take a look at our assumptions in a single week, especially as we walk with God. I'll tip my hand to one assumption I am making. I assume that an intimate conversational walk with God is available and is meant to be normal. I'll push that a step further. I assume that if you don't find that kind of relationship with God, your spiritual life will be stunted and that will handicap the rest of your life. We can't find life without God 
and we can't find God if we don't know how to walk with him. A passage from the Gospel of John will show you what I'm getting at. Jesus is talking about his relationship with us, how he is the good shepherd and we are his sheep. Now listen to how he describes the relationship. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. From the Gospel of John, chapter 10. The sheep live in dangerous country. The only way they can move securely in and out and find pasture is to follow their shepherd closely. Yet most Christians assume that the way to find the life God has for us is A, believe in God, B, be a good person, and C, he'll deliver the rest. A plus B equals C. But Jesus says, no, there's more to the equation. I do want life for you to the full. But you have to realize there is a thief. He's trying to destroy you. There are false shepherds, too. Don't listen to them. Don't just wander off looking for pasture. You need to do more than believe in me. You have to stay close to me. Listen to my voice. Let me lead. Now, there's a thought. If you don't hold the same assumptions Jesus does, you haven't got a chance of finding the life he has for you. Does God still speak? I was talking on the phone yesterday with a young woman who was interviewing me for an article of some sort. She asked what this book was about, and I tried to explain it in this way. This is a sort of tutorial on how to walk with God and how to hear his voice. I told her several stories, including the one about the Christmas tree ordeal. There was a long pause, that pregnant sort of pause that tells me I've just hit upon a great need and a great doubt. Finally, she asked, what do you say to people who say God isn't that intimate with us? I had a hunch. It was something in the tone of her voice that she hadn't experienced the Christian life in the ways I had been describing. Maybe because she'd never been told this is available. Maybe it's as simple as the fact that no one had ever shown her how. Is God really that intimate with us? That's a good place to begin. It might seem trivial that I'm bothering the God of the universe with a family outing for a Christmas tree. Does God really care about that kind of stuff? Is he really that intimate with us? Let's start with this much. God certainly knows us that intimately. Listen to Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. 
For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Whatever else we might believe about intimacy with God at this point, the truth is that God knows us very intimately. He knows what time you went to bed last night. He knows what you dreamed about. He knows what you had for breakfast this morning. He knows where you left your car keys, what you think about your aunt, and why you're going to dodge your boss at 2.30 today. The scriptures make that very clear. You are known intimately. But does God seek intimacy with us? Well, start at the beginning. The first man and woman, Adam and Eve, knew God and talked with him. And even after their fall, God goes looking for them. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? Genesis 3, 8 and 9. That is such a beautiful story. It tells us that even in our sin, God still wants us and comes looking for us. The rest of the Bible continues the story of God seeking us out, calling us back to himself. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you will seek him, he will be found by you. 2 Chronicles 15.2 I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says, Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. James 4, verse 8. Let us draw near to God. Hebrews 10, 22. Intimacy with God is the purpose of our lives. It's why God created us, not simply to believe in him, though that is a good beginning, not only to obey him, though that is a higher life still. God created us for intimate fellowship with himself, and in doing so, he established the goal of our existence— to know Him, love Him, and live our lives in an intimate relationship with Him. Jesus says that eternal life is to know God in John 17, verse 3. Not just know about, like you know about the ozone layer or Ulysses S. Grant. He means know, as two people know each other. Know, as Jesus knows the Father, intimately. But does God speak to his people? Well, can you imagine any relationship where there is no communication whatsoever? What would you think if you met two good friends for coffee and you knew they'd been at the cafe for an hour before you even got there? But as you sat down and asked them, so what have you been talking about? They said, nothing, nothing, nothing. We don't talk to each other, but we're really good friends. Jesus calls us his friends. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. John 15:15. 15, 15. Or what would you think about a father if you asked him, what have you been talking to your children about lately? And he said, nothing. I don't talk to them, but I love them very much. 
wouldn't you say the relationship was missing something? And aren't you God's son or daughter? Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John 1.12 Now, I know, I know. The prevailing belief is that God speaks to his people only through the Bible. And let me make this clear. He does speak to us first and foremost through the Bible. That is the basis for our relationship. The Bible is the eternal and unchanging word of God to us. It is such a gift to have right there in black and white God's thoughts towards us. We know right off the bat that any other supposed revelation from God that contradicts the Bible is not to be trusted. So, I am not minimizing in any way the authority of Scripture or the fact that God speaks to us through the Bible. However, many Christians believe that God only speaks to us through the Bible. And the irony of that belief is, that's not what the Bible says. First off, the Bible is filled with stories of God talking to his people. Abraham, who is called the friend of God, said, The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me. Genesis 24, 7. God spoke to Moses, quote, as a man speaks with his friend. Exodus thirty three eleven. He spoke to Aaron, too. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites. Exodus six thirteen. And David, in the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. The Lord said, Go up. David asked, Where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. Second Samuel 2, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Noah. The Lord spoke to Gideon. The Lord spoke to Samuel. The list goes on and on. I can hear the objections even now, but that was different. Those were special people called to special tasks. And we are not special people called to special tasks? I refuse to believe that. And I doubt that you want to believe it either in your heart of hearts. But for the sake of argument, notice that God also speaks to, quote, less important characters in the Bible. God spoke to Hagar, the servant girl of Sarah, as she was running away. Quote, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees even me. Genesis sixteen thirteen, The God who sees even me. How touching. In the New Testament, God speaks to a man named Ananias who plays a small role in seven verses in Acts chapter 9. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. From Acts chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. Now, if God doesn't also speak to us, why would he have given us all these stories of him speaking to others? Look, here are hundreds of inspiring and hopeful stories about how God spoke to his people in this and that situation. Isn't it amazing? But you can't have that. He doesn't speak like that anymore. That makes no sense at all. Why would God give you a book of exceptions? This is how I used to relate to my people, but I don't do that anymore. What good would a book of exceptions do you? That's like giving you the owner's manual for a Dodge, even though you drive a Mitsubishi. No, the Bible is a book of examples of what it looks like to walk with God. To say that he doesn't offer that to us is just so disheartening. It's also unbiblical. The Bible teaches us that we hear God's voice. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. Isaiah 50 verse 4. For he is our God 
and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They, too, will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. From John chapter 10, verses 2 through 4 and 14 through 16. We are his sheep. Jesus says that the sheep hear his voice. Listen to this from the book of Revelation. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus is speaking. He makes an offer. Who is this offer for? Anyone. That would include you, by the way. And what does Jesus say will happen? Hears my voice, as in, hear his voice. And if we respond to his voice and his knocking, what will Jesus do? I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Sharing a meal is an act of communion, an offer of friendship. Jesus wants to pull up a chair, linger at our table, and talk with us. He offers to be intimate with us. What could be clearer? We are made for intimacy with God. He wants intimacy with us. And that intimacy requires communication. God speaks to his people. But what about me? Back to the interview. Finally, we got down to the real issue. The young woman then asked, Well, what do you say to people who say, I don't hear God like that? Okay, now that's different. It's one thing to say, God doesn't speak to his people. It's another thing to say, I don't hear God speaking to me. This is what was fueling all her objections. She doesn't hear the voice of God like that. I felt bad for her. Here she had embraced all these theological assumptions as to why God doesn't speak to his people because she hasn't experienced God speaking to her. Well, for one thing, if you've been taught that God doesn't speak to you, then you're probably not going to be listening for his voice. This all comes down to what kind of relationship you think God offers. It takes time, I said. It's something we learn. Name one thing in your life that you really enjoy doing that didn't require practice to get there. If you want to make music, you have to learn how to play an instrument. And in the beginning, it doesn't sound too good. All the squawks and squeaks and bad timing. You really are on your way to making music. It just sounds like you're strangling a pig. But if you stick with it, something beautiful begins to emerge. Or how about snowboarding? Learning to do that is really awkward at first. You fall down a lot. You feel like an idiot. But if you hang in there, you come to enjoy it. You get better. It starts to feel natural. And that's when it becomes fun. This holds true for anything in life, including our walk with God. It takes time and practice. It's awkward at first, and sometimes we feel stupid. But if we hang in there, we do begin to get it. And as it becomes more and more natural, our lives are filled with his presence and all the joy and beauty and pleasure that come with it. It is something to be learned and it is worth learning. So there, you have my first assumption. An intimate conversational walk with God is available, is normal even, or is meant to be normal. I'm well aware that a majority of people do not enjoy that yet, but it is certainly what God desires and what he offers. 
My assumption is based on the nature of God and the nature of man made in his image. We are communicators. My assumption is also based on the nature of relationship. It requires communication. It is based on the long record of God speaking to his people of various ranks in all sorts of situations. And finally, it is based on the teachings of Jesus, who tells us that we hear his voice. Now for assumption number two. What is God up to? I'm sitting in front of my computer this morning, my finger frozen over the left click button on my mouse. My email program is asking me, are you sure you want to delete this message? And I'm not so sure. It is such a good email. It's incontestable, undeniable. It's long overdue. Someone has ticked me off. Details to remain undisclosed because they will probably listen to this book. And I've written what I feel to be is a very honest, straightforward, somewhat shaming, and altogether irrefutable reply. I'm about to hit the send button with the same satisfaction you see on the face of a player who gets to slam dunk a ball he stole on a fast break in the final four. This is going to be so good. And then God says, don't do it. Don't do it? Ah, oh, something in me sinks. The ref just blew a whistle. There's a foul on the play. Dang, it was going to be so good. It was deserved. Why can't I send this? I don't need for God to reply. I know why. The fact that I found the whole process so utterly delicious tells me why. You know that delicious. You have these moments too. Those conversations you have in your head where you are brilliant and the other person is speechless. I can sense the Spirit saying, it won't do any good. They aren't in a place to hear it. Let it go. A long pause. A deep sigh. Things are shifting down inside. I'm accepting more than guidance here. I'm accepting change. Down in my soul, where the juncture of my will and my heart meet, I am accepting transformation. I click yes and let the whole thing go. Jesus says that as our good shepherd, he is leading us. What an encouraging thought. Jesus is leading you, and he's leading me. He is shepherding us. I can feel something in my heart loosening even now as I consider it. Okay, I don't have to make life happen on my own. Now, if Christ takes it upon himself to lead, then our part is to follow. And you'll find that it helps a great deal in your following if you know what God is up to. True, we may not know exactly what God is up to in this or that event in our lives. Why didn't I get the job? How come she won't return my calls? Why haven't my prayers healed this cancer? I don't know. Sometimes we can get clarity and sometimes we can't. But whatever else is going on, we can know this. God is always up to our transformation. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. That's Romans eight twenty nine and 30 from the message. You see, God has something in mind. He is deeply and personally committed to restoring humanity, restoring you. He had a specific man or woman in mind when he made you. By bringing you back to himself through the work of Jesus Christ, he has established relationship with you. And now, what he is up to is restoring you. He does that by shaping your life, quote, along the same lines as the life 
of his Son, end quote. By shaping you into the image of Jesus. You can be confident of this. It's a given. Whatever else might be going on in your life, God always has his eye on your transformation. This is good news, by the way. All of the other things we long for in life, love and friendship, freedom and wholeness, clarity of purpose, all the joy we long for, it all depends on our restoration. You can't find or keep good friends while you are still an irritating person to be around. And there is no way love can flourish while you are still controlling. You can't find your real purpose in life while you're still slavishly serving other people's expectations of you. And you can't find peace while you're ruled by fear. You can't enjoy what you have while you're envying what the other guy has. On and on it goes. God wants us to be happy. Really. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. But he knows that in order for us to be truly happy, we have to be whole. Another word for that is holy. We have to be restored. Think of it this way. Think of how you feel when you really screw things up. The look on your son's face as you yell at him. The distance that's grown between you, even though you apologized for the hundredth time. How it tears you up inside to indulge in romantic fantasies about someone else's spouse. You want that, but you don't want that. But you wish you could, but you don't really. And why is this going on inside? The guilt you feel when you lie straight face to a friend and they find out. The hours you've wasted harboring resentment, the embarrassment of your addictions, you know what plagues you. Now, what would it be like to never, ever do it again? Not even to struggle with it. What would your life be like if you were free of all that haunts you? Oh, the joy, the utter relief it would be to be transformed. That itself would be more happiness than most of us ever experience. And, as if that were not enough, it would free us to live the life God has for us to live. My friends, this is what God is up to. This is where our shepherd is headed. Whatever else is going on in our lives, this is going on. He is committed to our transformation. So, if this is what God's up to, wouldn't it make sense that we be more intentional in partnering with him in our transformation? Part of me wishes I could have sent that email, but the deeper, truer part of me is relieved that God stopped me. It would have hurt that person. I would have regretted it later. It would have created a crisis that would have taken hours of emotional energy to undo. I can't begin to number the disasters God has averted like that, the things he stopped me from saying, the choices I would have made had he not intervened. I want to walk with God. You've been listening to John Eldridge read from his book, Walking with God. Now, we'll continue next week with part two, but if you want to dive deeper, I encourage you to get this book. You can find it at your favorite retailer, I'm Alan Arnold, and you've been listening to the Ransom Tar Podcast.